Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. I would like to thank especially the team from HRIA for the opportunity to hold this presentation to its members this afternoon. My name is Kim Kellaway, and I'm Head of Clients and Markets at HRB Manjad, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. Today, we're going to be presenting what should your business be considering, the COVID-19 update. Our presenters from HLB Man Judd will be Nicholas Guest, Partner in Corporate Advisory, Matt Hocking, Director, Restructuring and Risk Advisory, Mariana von Lucan, Partner Tax Consulting, and James McFarlane, Director and Debt Advisory. Our format today will include polling throughout the presentation and a Q&A session at the end of our presentations. So I would encourage you to use the Q&A control on the Zoom control bar. Um, and I would encourage you to enter your questions throughout the presentation, and then we will answer those at the end. Um, I also have a number of questions that have been sent to me from the team at HRIA that were uploaded to the Facebook page. Um, and we will address those. So to start our presentation today, I would like to introduce Nicholas Chu from HRIA. Thank you, Nicholas. Thanks, Kim. Um, on behalf of the HRIA, um, we're really thankful that HRB has made themselves available to do this webinar. And gosh, what a, what a crazy few weeks it's been. Um, we've been reaching out to a lot of our members and we've been hearing a lot of stories around um, how tough it is right now, and also some stories around um, how businesses have pivoted and what they're looking forward to into the future. Um, today, more than anything, is an opportunity for us to hear from um, our advisory experts, HLB Manjad. And as members of the HRA, overwhelmingly, what we want for you is to be able to, number one, weather the storm that you're going through right now, but also position yourselves so that um, when we come out of this, and we've all come out of this, um, our members are positioned in the best possible place to accelerate out of this and, and grow their businesses, um, uh, rebuild and, also, and hopefully um, really uh, shoot to the stars. So um, on behalf of the HRIA, thank you for joining. Um, as Kim mentioned, there will be a Q&A section. Um, I'd also encourage you, if you have uh, questions, which are probably might be a little bit more sensitive in nature, please do reach out to HLB Manjad via Kim. Um, they are there, they have a wealth of experience and they're, they're available to support members of the HRIA. Um, but please enjoy this uh, webinar, take out of it all the information that you need. Uh, I'll hand over now to Nicholas Guest. Uh, Nicholas is a familiar face for a lot of you at the state meetings. He's been to quite a few of the, of the functions. Um, he is the partner, a partner in the corporate advisory portion of HLB Manjad, a wealth of experience there. So um, thank you and I'll, Nicholas, I'll let you go ahead. Thanks, Nick, uh, and welcome everybody. Um, we do have a fair bit of content to get across today. Um, we'll, three main uh, sections we'll, we'll talk through. Um, Matt will run through managing the risks in your business in the current environment and how we can respond to the current situation. Now, Mariana will focus on some of the government support that's available at the moment. And then James um, will talk around some of the debt funding uh, and what we can do there to help on our debt. So I'll throw over to Matt to start on the risk session. Thanks, Nick. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you for coming to this webinar. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of things today, one being um, basically a framework um, for, for businesses um, to follow uh, you know, during, during uh, this uncertain time, um, some key issues to consider. And also I'm gonna to touch on, on the um, SME commercial leasing principles, uh, the code of conduct, which has recently been announced uh, by government. So just some things that, that all business owners should be considering now um, and a framework that, that we've been recommending to our clients to follow um, is first and foremost just to understand uh, your current position. So, you know, understand your debtors, your taxation accruals and lodgements, your creditors position and um, related party debts. 
if your management reporting isn't current, um, you really should take action to bring it up to date now. And if you think that maybe your reporting framework is deficient, so the management or the board not receiving um, adequately timed and accurate reporting, um, then you need to review that framework framework and see that it you know, can be uh, can be brought up to date so that that management um, are able to make decisions based on the correct information. Um, as part of this process and understanding your position, you know, given that you know, especially uh, uh, members um, who are in the events industry basically are in closed down, um, they do need to have active management of key stakeholders. Having open and honest conversations with your financiers, your landlords, the ATO, and key suppliers will assist you and give your business time to react to the changing landscape you're now facing. So part of, part of this process is uh, you need to estimate the costs that you have to continue. So you, you need to make a, a realistic estimation of the monthly cost to continue the business. Basically, we think through the end of 2020, maybe a little bit further. And that will include um, taking into consideration all the government assistance, which Mariana will touch on some key measures uh, for the end of this webinar. Um, you, should, you should review the minimal, minimize, and minimise the cost base for business, especially if your revenue is depleted, like those in the events industry. Um, you know, review a list of the expenses and then try to establish the key conversations that you need to have and the people within your organisation uh, that should have them. Part of this process, uh, you should develop a flexible cash flow forecast if that is possible. Um, and that forecast should be brought upon the organisational drivers and lead revenue indicators. Um, this is highly critical, given that the, the market is so uncertain. Um, it, it's, we really do believe that you, know, you be, need to be able to pivot quickly, you need to be able to understand your position um, at any point in time so that you're able to make the right decisions um, you know, what, when you hit speed bumps along the road. So part of those that forecasts when you're preparing it, you need to consider a number of things. One being the government stimulus incentives, um, uh, the employee stand down arrangements that may be in place and your JobKeeper payment access, bank and ATO forbearance agreements, and your commercial arrangements with your landlords and your other key suppliers. So the next stage, once you've done all done that process, is then to consider what further funding you may need. So hopefully through going through that process, you're able to generally land on a, on, a, on a figure that you think may be the shortfall in your business, and then you can start to, to work with your advisors to determine, okay, how, how am I gonna meet any funding deficiency? Um, and I'm, am I gonna be able to borrow money, for example, uh, using getting the correct facilities and at the right rates uh, that will help me um, how my business out the other side of, of this downturn. So there is, there may be a need, you know, if, if you have further concerns following undertaking that process, that you do engage an advisor to do an external review of your business. Um, that can be very beneficial in giving you options, and especially giving you options uh, with people who have experience, you know, in, in a distressed marketplace um, to protect not only your business but also your personal situation. Um, as people are, may be aware, there is a moratorium on uh, insolvent trading liability for directors for the next six months. Um, that protection won't last forever. Um, and directors still need to consider that there are personal liabilities for things like superannuation, pay to withholding, and in some cases now GST, um, as well as the director's duties, which are unaffected. So clear and um, careful planning throughout this, this period is essential. So to consider your options and to monitor your business, um, we're recommending that you document kind of a, a new business plan uh, for your business so that you're, you, you really are able to communicate to the management team and to the broader organisation um, what you're forecasting and managing the key drivers and issues are within the business. This will be different for all types of businesses and I guess the size and complexity of your business. Um, but having a sort of short-term strategic plan, um, we believe is, is highly, it's gonna be very essential for you to, to be able to come out the other side of this downturn. So Kim, I might just um, we'll go to the poll question, um, which is, do you, believe, it, Matt. Yep. do you believe you have a solid understanding of your current financial position 
costs to continue and develop a forecast for 2020. Move on to the next slide. Your numbers are still going through, Matt. I'll just. No problem. Quite a few of our participants are responding to this poll. And I'll just end the poll there now. So, just some, some key issues um, that all business owners should consider, consider at the moment. Uh, one is, is this concept of standing down employees um, and that, you know, obviously in many businesses, small and large, as we've seen, this has been essential given how adversely affected um, certain industries have been. However, for those businesses that, you know, are able to continue to trade and, and haven't seen an you know, extreme decline in revenue, it may not be the best option and other considerations need to be undertaken before you decide to stand down your employees. And, you know, one being, I guess, um, satisfaction of employees and also, you know, your recruitment uh, long term, given that many employees, if, if they don't uh, see why stand down is important, um, may look to find uh, different employment in the future. Uh, another key issue which, which all business owners need to consider if they're going to have to put money into their business is taking security in respect of related party funding. Um, and registering that security so that you have a priority and that that money is protected and, and the family wealth is protected um, if you're funding that business. That can get complicated depending on the other financing arrangements that you have in place, um, but it's something that should be considered before any money is put in by business owners into their business to keep it going. Uh, hibernation and, and a spring planning, obviously a lot of businesses, especially in the higher industry, are, are in hibernation, effectively have had to shut down. Um, but as, as the quarantine and the social distancing um, provisions are, are, I guess, wound back, you know, consideration needs to be given to how you're going to fund your working capital of, of new stock, rent, employees, etc., cetera, um, as the economy starts to open up again. Um, you know, and also, how are you going to operate um, so that your employees, when they return to work, I guess, minimise further spread of COVID-19, uh, should that happen again? and um, how you're going to operate long-term with social distancing provisions that are in place. Uh, another key issue is customer credit management. As I touched on before, with this moratorium on solvent trading, um, that may mean that a few more businesses than they normally would will continue to operate when they're in severe financial distress, and they may be running on your credit, essentially when they're running on empty. So you have to be very, very careful if you're giving credit to your customers um, that you have adequate security in place if it's stuff like stock or equipment, um, you've got your trade insurance in place if you can get it, um, and your credit policies are fairly robust. So we are expecting to see a high level of defaults um, and, and a lot more um, companies probably enter external administration of some form in, over the next 12 months. So just next slide, please. So lastly, I'm going to touch on um, the SME commercial leasing principles and code of conduct, which has just been announced. Um, essentially, um, this is a code which is only accessible to a tenant that is one, a commercial tenant. Um, so that's retail office industrial premises. This doesn't apply for residential tenancies. And secondly, is an SME tenant. So we're being, el el sorry, being eligible for the JobKeeper payment program and having an annual turnover of up to 50 million. So the key um, parameters around the relief that's provided uh, is the amount of rent reduction is based on the, redu the reduction of the tenant's turnover during the COVID-19 period. So this is effectively the JobKeeper time period that that, pop, that um, program is in place. Um, and that landlords must have a proportionate rent reductions that relate to uh, what your tenant's turnover. So if your tenant's turnover, sorry, tenants. Uh, so if your business turnover reduces by 50%, then your landlord must offer a proportionate so a reduction in rent for that, for that amount. Uh, of, that, of that reduction, 
50% uh, is rent that's completely waived, so you wouldn't have to pay it back. And the other 50% of that is actually uh, deferred. And that deferral must be amortised over a period of greater of the remaining lease term for 24 months. So just some other things around the code of conduct. Um, that any amount of reduction by the rental waiver, so the rent is meant to be waived, cannot be recouped by the landlord. Our landlords are unable to terminate the lease uh, for this non-payment period. Um, tenants must comply with the terms of the lease and these negotiated changes. If you have a material failure where you just don't comply, then you're forfeited, you forfeit the protections um, provided by the code. Uh, the landlords must not draw on the tenant's security, so if you've given a cash bond or bank guarantee um, for any non-payment of rent during this period, um, and the tenants should be given the opportunity to extend their leases for an equivalent period of the rent waiver or the deferral period. Um, thank you, Kim. I might pass over to Mariana now to talk about some of the um, other issues in terms of cash crews and job keeping. I think we must have some issues in terms of Mariana's audio. Um, so what I think we might do, we might just go okay, to Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Apologies. Um, That's with the, um, I wanted to talk about the um, cash boost, um, the JobKeeper, uh, some grants that are available, 10,000 grants that may be of interest to everyone here. Um, and just quickly touch on the deferral of payroll. Some of you already know that and probably no one cares about that right now. Um, sorry about that. I was sort of um, trying to get some, we just got the latest um, bit on the alternative test that just came out in the legislation. So I was trying to read all that so I could answer some questions. Um, so on the cash boost, I won't spend too much time on it because it is an automatic thing. So that means when you lodge your BAS, a lot of you have probably received some of it already. Um, the maximum amount you can get is 10,000. Sorry, the maximum amount you can get is 100,000. So from March to June, you'll get 50 maximum. And then from July sort of to September, you'll get another 50. And they're spread in different ways is how you get it. But the way to get it is lodging the business activity statement. So some of you would have already lodged your March activity statement. Um, you don't get the money earlier than the 28th of April. But I have seen people um, or clients, uh, their accounts being credited for the um, cash boost already. So that's fantastic. Uh, so the simplest form is, is if you have a, you're a quarterly lodger and all your PYG withholding for the quarter is over 50,000, then they'll credit you up to 50,000 only for that March BAS. If you're a March lodger, March lodger and you don't use up the whole 50, then you can still get a bite of cherry, bite of the cherry in June. So you can get up to 50,000. So whatever you got for the those two Baz lodges, if you like, for March and June, you'll get the same amount again, but you'll get it over two more periods. You'll get it in, in July effectively when you lodge your June Baz, but you'll only get 50%. So say you got 50,000 in the first half of the year, you'll get 25,000 in June and 25,000 in September. That's if you're a quarterly lodger, quite complex. It's gonna be automatic anyway. I just want to you know, sort of explain a little bit how it works. If you're a um, monthly lodger, then what they'll do is they'll times your PYG withholding by three and they'll give you that as a credit. That acknowledges that you've paid salary and wages uh, or tax effectively, not salary and wages, just tax in January and February. So again, that can be useful. If you've got a, um, a credit sitting there, it'll offset your GST. So it is a bit of a, a help with it from a cash perspective, but it's not everything. Um, it's good, it's, it's tax free, it's not a gift, it's not accessible to you, and it doesn't go into part of your projection for your, um, your job keeper when you're doing your calculations there. So if I um, if just ask a poll, um, Hey, do most of you already know that you're entitled to the 100? You know what you're entitled to from the cash boost? Bear with me just for a moment. I'm just and putting that through, Noel. Yep. It's there now. 
So I'm not, I'm not going into this in great detail and it was a very big overview, I understand that. Um, and the reason is because one, it's really automatic. It's gonna happen, you're gonna get it. Um, I explain it because some people wanna know when they're projecting their cash flows, they wanna know exactly when it's gonna come in. And if you need to know more, certainly um, let us know. And there's many ways to do that. Kim will send you notes after this seminar. We're just still um, going through cash some boost, calling, yeah, If you're entitled to the 100, and what are we getting? Can you see? Yes, so Kim? we're just, uh, we're halfway through and I'll, I'll close the poll now. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Yep, thank you. Um, yep, next slide. So JobKeeper, I think this is the bit where um, it's much more interesting. Um, it's now been in, uh, the legislation's been in for two weeks. Um, the rules have only been probably, yeah, a week and a half, the rules, the actual guidelines. The thing that I think that's of most interest is, are you an eligible employer? Uh, just the headings. Um, are you an eligible employee? Do you have eligible employees? And do you pass eligibility? Great, what happens then? What do I need to do? So that's what I want to cover in today's seminar. Um, okay, so the first thing is you have to identify, now I won't assume this, but you have to have businesses here. If there's businesses with an aggregated turnover of under a billion, then you use a rate of 30%. If businesses have aggregated turnovers of over a billion, then you use 50%. I'm assuming there's no um, ACNC registered organizations on this call. I'll make that from the beginning. They have a different percentage. Now, when I say aggregated turnover, I mean worldwide income. So if you're a hire a company that is owned from overseas, you include their income. Now, in most cases, um, you'll know whether um, you are over the billion because you're, you're likely to be, you probably are a significant global entity and you complete a country by country report. If you know what that means, you're probably in that 50%. If you don't know what that means, you're under, you're probably under, you're in that 30%. That's probably the easiest way to explain it. Um, but it includes all your income when you're trying to work out um, the rate. But I'm going to talk about mainly the 30% rate for the presentation. But if you know that you're over a billion, just substitute that for 50% for simplicity's sake. So you have to have a decline in your projected turnover, and that we'll discuss in a minute, um, of 30% or more. Um, and I'll discuss when as well. You would have had to pay your employees 1,500 per point night, so 3,000 for the month of April or 3,250 of you doing it monthly, um, but you're only gonna get back 3,000. So uh, whatever you, you pay them, that's the only amount that you're gonna get back, 1,500 a fortnight. And include self-employed. So some of you here may be self-employed. Um, I don't know if you could be a sole trader as a hire, I assume so. Um, or you could be running it through a company. Now, why I've put that in there is because in some cases you might be, you know, might be a business company, you might be the director, you've started up um, this business and you've decided not to pay yourself a salary, you might be paying yourself dividends. Or you might be paying yourself dividends and you have employees. You could have employees, you might not have employees. So it's important there because you're, um, you're not getting any salary. So you're thinking to yourself, am I eligible for JobKeeper? And the answer would be yes, um, but uh, as a business participant, and I'll go through that in a minute. Are you an eligible employee? So you have to be employed from one March. You probably read about that. Um, you have to be Australian resident, um, Australian citizen, permanent resident, New Zealand resident is a subclass 444. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the other visa holders may be excluded. And that, if you need to know the detail, um, it's probably more in the Fair Work Acts, um, whether they fit the category or not. The definition will be there somewhere. Um, they have to be over 16. So if your kids are working in the business, they're not entitled if they're under 16. Has to be a full-time, part-time or a casual. Now casual has a definition and I think this, this bit people could get wrong. Uh, casuals have to be with you for 12 months and have to be working on a regular and, and um, consistent, I think they call it, there's regular in other word, but um, consistent method. So meaning, you know, that they would have been employed over that period in some sort of um, consistent way and regularly. Uh, so that is a definition its own right. 
Uh, but in the simplest form, if you've got someone working with you for 12 months as a casual, and you know it is a pretty regular basis that they're working with you, uh, then they should pass and should be part of this JobKeeper. Now, the employer sends out nomination forms, and I'll discuss that in a bit more detail later. Um, the nomination forms are sent to the employee. The employee has to notify the employer that they're going to nominate them to be the principal employer. So effectively, um, they, they could be working for other places and may decide another employer might be their principal, but they can only get the JobKeeper once. So only one employer can pay them. It is the liability will fall on the employee if they lie to you. Um, so you might want to let them know that. Um, they can't get it twice. And if they do, that is a contravention and they'll have problems later. So you've passed um, eligibility. You can enrol in the JobKeeper. That's already started on the 20th of April. Don't rush out there to go and enrol. The enrolment takes two seconds, trust me. It is the easiest form to fill out making it the most dangerous form to fill out. Um, because I think what you need to really make sure of is make it bulletproof is that you've got a declining value. And some of you that I've talked to, it's not so obvious. In others, you know, depending the industry you're in, it's gone way down. So that'll be very clear. So it's only when you're borderline, I wouldn't rush in there and I would really look at these projections. So when you, um, I'll go through the test in a minute. Let me just carry on with this. Um, so the employee has a nomination notice, which we talked about. And um, if you're an eligible business participant, you can have, you can notify that you're going to form part of the JobKeeper. Now, if you're a sole trader, you don't need to fill out an employee nomination form or a business participant nomination form. All you need to do is enroll. Um, and then, you know, you prepare and submit the enrollment. So poll question, do you think you're entitled to JobKeeper? Now I know I haven't gone through um, what the projected turnover is and everything, but knowing what you know at the moment, do you think you're already entitled to it? And some of you may have already been doing this test. I'm sure you've been looking at the ATO website. Let me know if we should move on, Kim. I know, we're still good yep. for a minute. Yep. Yep. Okay, we'll end that poll, Mariana. Thank you. If I can go to the next slide, please. So with the, um, so we've worked out the rate, we've, uh, we've worked out our aggregated turnover. Now we wanna know what is our, our calculating, how to calculate the decline in turnover. Now you can do it on a, a basic test method um, or an alternative test method. And then just until about an hour ago, we didn't have what the alternative test period was. So we didn't know what the methods were. So that's just come out, the legislative instrument, basically the rules. Um, so if I just start with a basic test, if you can meet the basic test, you can't go and apply the alternative test. The alternative test is very specific and I'll go through that. So the basic test is basically you test your turnover, your projected turnover or your actual for the month of March or April. So if you look at March, we've already had March, so that'll be actual. If you look at April, we're on the 23rd. So a lot of it will be actual and a, a bit of projection till the end of April. And then we compare, say if I'm comparing month of March, 2020, actual, I compare it to March, 2019. What am I comparing? I'm comparing, um, in most cases, it will just be you go to G1, don't take always G1, <laughs> but G1, you modify it. So G1 is what's on your business activity statement. So this is where your taxable supplies are for the month of March, your GST free supplies and your input tax supplies. Now also that the figure in your business activity statement shows the figure of sales plus GST. So when you're doing comparatives, you take out the GST, you look at your taxable supplies without GST, your GST free supplies, they don't have GST, and then you exclude any input tax supplies, which is any passive income, rent, dividends, interest. Exclude that from your calculation. It's as simple as that. Now, a lot of people are asking, is it accruals, is it cash? You know, what, what method? Well, follow it, you don't have to follow what you, you do for your VAS, but that's probably the safest way. So if you're following a cash system, 
um, and March, that will show cash in your current BAS for March. Then compare like for like, which is March 2020 to 2019. If you're using accruals, use accruals. Can you use different methods? Maybe, but don't get yourself confused. I think what you've actually got is the best way to test it and then prove it. Because the biggest thing about this, I think, is then justifying it later if you're on the borderline. I think some will be very clear, no, no questions asked, but those that aren't so clear, you have to be careful. I would also, if you're not 100% sure, I would check April if you're, if you're not meeting it for March. And if you're not quite clear, why don't you test April to June? So there's three tests you can do to work out what your turnover is. Now, if you're doing April, you're doing actual plus projected. And projected turnover is, is, is basically, these are all G, they're GST concepts. Um, so they say, what, is, what are you likely than not to receive? What do you know you're going to receive? Or you can guess you're going to receive, given what you know. And it depends on your circumstances. Very vague, isn't it? <laughs> but that, that's the way it's written. In, in there's a ruling on what is a GST projected income. Uh, so you, would, you could grab April to June and you could project. You know where your market's at. You know whether your, your sales are going down and you could project that and you could project there basically that you've had that turn down of 30%. If you meet that tick because you've got a comparative, then you move on and then you go down that track of um, registering. And I'll go through that in, a, in the last slide, but let's just go back a bit now. So say you're a new business, you've only been in the high business for, I don't know, six months. Or say, for example, you're a high growth business, so you've grown rapidly. So your comparatives don't really make sense. Or um, there are other examples of businesses in there in the um, legislation, but I won't go through that. That's more like construction companies. You might have had a big restructure. So those kind of things to watch out for, but assume none of those are there. Um, if it is for the startup, um, what they're saying is that you take the comparative month, so you take a month like March or you take the month of April, whichever you choose, and you take an average of the last few months that you were in operation. So if you were in operation from on October, you get one October to February and divide that number by the number of months. So, um, and then you get a number, so you get an average. So that average you compare to the, the March 2020 and they'll accept that. Um, and so on. So, you, you know, so the, the alternative method, which has just been published, um, I'm not sure where you find it, I just got the link, uh, but I'd say through the treasury.gov.au website under JobKeeper, that's where the rules and explanatory statement are. So for those that want to actually look at it. Now, what I didn't say at the beginning, which I should have said, is why is this so important? Is that it, each employee, if you qualify, they will be entitled to 19,500 over the next six months. Because once you qualify, you're in. You don't need to keep retesting. So that's why I say test it a couple of times, make sure you've got some backup and make sure it's bulletproof. If you have you know, 10 employees, that's 195,000 that the government will give you. Admittedly, you would have had to spend that because um, one of the things is that you have to make a minimum payment of 1,500 per fortnight per employee. So that's 3,000. And there is a question there which I will answer on the next slide um, about what about if you don't want to make that minimum payment. You, you qualify, but you haven't got the cash. So I'll answer that in a minute. So you've, you've met the alternative test um, and you're in. So again, what we're saying projected turnover is basically what's included in taxable supplies, GST free supplies, no GST itself. Um, and one thing to note is if you are a group, so a GST group or a tax consolidated group, you look at each employer individually. So where does your PAYG sit? Where do, who pays the PAYG? Which employer pays that? If you've got two or three, then two or three can do the application and do the turnover test It'll, and see if each one is eligible. You don't group the whole group together. That's only to work out whether the aggregated turnover, otherwise they're all standalone entities. So if you have intercompany um, charges they'll, and it's an income item, that'll be taken into account as income. So it's a standalone. 
and you exclude input tax suppliers not connected with Australia. So effectively, if you have an overseas parent, you don't include their income for working out the 30% drop. Um, let me see if I've, I'm thinking if I've explained everything that I, I can in that time. Now maybe, do you need assistance with your registration, including projecting your GST turnover? Maybe if I just do that poll question and we can get to your questions because I'm sure sometimes it's easier to go through your exact questions. Um, just going through at the minutes. moment with it, Mariana. I think there's a lot to absorb in such a short time. Um, but the good thing is that you only have to look at it for one type of entity, which is your own. Um, I might have to look at it for a few few different types, so it's a little bit harder. Okay, probably that's yep. end of the poll for you. Thank yes. you. So just on this side um, here, assistance with um, satisfying the eligibility requirement, we have provided assistance with employers, um, whether they meet the eligibility for employees and for sole traders. Remember, sole traders, um, you can also have um, a business where it's a, it's a company you trade through, a trust you trade through, or a partnership you trade through. But only one participant is able to apply for the JobKeeper. So if you have two shareholders, mum and dad, your business, you're not getting salary and wages. If you are getting salary and wages and a dividend, you can't get both. You'll be on the job keeper for the salary and wages. You wouldn't um, apply for the business participation, by the way. Okay. Um, and if you're a sole trader getting wages elsewhere, you can't participate either under the business participation. Um, so you can't get a double dippy. Uh, assistance with calculating decline in value, if you do need that, it's not simply just looking at G1, um, although for some it may be it may be starting point and you go through it from there. So what do you do now? You're qualified or you're not 100% sure you're qualified? You're not 100% sure, that's why we exist. Come and talk to us. Um, if you're 100% sure you want to get on with it, you're probably already enrolled. And if you've already enrolled, now how do you enroll? You go through the business portal or you go through your tax agent portal. Tax agent portal would be us or your tax agent. Um, but a business portal is something you might have yourself, you've set up. Now, just recall that the OzKey has changed at 29th of March. So now it's all under my, my gov and you have to have a trusted key, which is, it's like a little app on your phone. So it's quite easy to get in once you've set it all up, but setting it up may be a little bit of a pain. We have given instructions to our clients as to how to set it up. So Kim could probably send that to you after this presentation. Now, what you've done that online, so what comes next? Now, usually you have to get the employee nomination before you enroll online technically, if, they, if the ATO, if you look at their website, but I wouldn't worry. So long as you get your forms back by, by the end of April, now recognise that, and the ATO recognises that you may have sent the forms out, but they're on leave, they can't sign them, they can't get them back to you electronically. Um, you could, um, employees can come back in an email and you can record that. Whether you need the sign form or not, I don't think it really matters, so long as you've got some proof that the employee has elected and has filled out the form. Now, if you don't wanna use the ATO form, you can use your own form and the ATO has a format you can use, what information you'll need to pick up on that. Because what the form is saying to the employees is they're saying, okay, I meet all the criteria, I'm eligible. Okay, I'm not under 16, I'm an Australian resident, etc. Um, and I I'm not applying for JobKeeper anywhere else. And then they're signing it. So hence why it's important to have. It's based on self-assessment, so you only need to keep that notice, but it's important you have that notice and you need to keep it for five years. If you have a tax agent, give a copy to your tax agent to keep because it's bound that you'll lose it at some point and you'll need it. Um, now, as well as um, employee nominations, now if you're an organisation that you have all employees, the next point's not relevant to you. Eligible business participant nomination is not required to be lodged either, but required to be filled out by the person that's going to be um, chosen to receive the 1500 per fortnight. So that'd be, if you've got a company, it would be the director, if it's a trust, one of the, 
the um, beneficiaries of the trust, they wouldn't have had to receive a, a distribution in the past. Um, all it needs to be is that they've, these par participants are active in the business in some shape or form. If you have a partnership, it's just one of the partners. So you'd have to choose who that is. Seems a little unfair, I know, but then some of these um, shareholders could be shareholders in another company and they might be entitled somewhere else. Um, again, if you're a sole trader, you don't need to fill out the employee nomination nor the business participation business participation notice. You say that a couple of times and it's hard. Um, what we do know is that you're going to have to, um, through your simple tax payroll, single tax payroll, um, is go through and update that on a fortnightly basis um, to ensure that all your employees are eligible, meaning that you know they haven't left the organisation. Because if they leave the organisation and the tax office pays you for it, they will want that back. So just be aware of it. So you might get away with it for a little while, but then after all this dies down, they will come looking. They will come looking at turnover. They'll come looking for, have you got eligible employees? So best to keep all your records. Um, be smart about it now. So there is a little form which I'm sending out to people on single touch payroll and the ATO has produced. But basically what you need to find out is if your provider, your payroll provider that does single touch payroll, is linked to JobKeeper. So they've done upgrades. I know, for example, Zero and I think Myob does. They've done the upgrades for them and they have um, availability to look at the JobKeeper. So what that means is that you can go into your payroll before 30th of June and update and make sure all your employees are on there um, and the employees that shouldn't be on there should uh, are ticked accordingly. It's probably a little tick box to say, you know, they're entitled to JobKeeper or not. Some people have asked me, is, um, are they going to, is there something different about the payment summary? Again, this is going to be automatically generated by the system. If you're on single touch payroll and you've upgraded for JobKeeper, um, it will automatically happen. But there is a, a space in there that if you are topping up your staff, so I'll give you an example. If, you, if your staff has stood down and you're not paying them anything right now, but you're going to pay them JobKeeper, great. Um, that is um, um, a top up, they call it. So that'll be shown separately in the single touch payroll information when you put it through your payroll. And that'll probably show in the payment summary going forward. Now remember that the payment that you make, the 1500, you still have to take out tax, withholding tax. So it's like a salary and wage. Um, and the payment you receive of 1500 is assessable but you'll get that. It's a bit of a washout when, you, when it, you've got um, stood down employees. If you're paying them a minimum of 3,000 a month, then effectively you'll pay them 3,000 a month. It'll go on your expenses and then you'll get the income from, you'll get a reimbursement in May for those employees. Nine, well, the, exactly for all those employees that you've paid. The only difficulty I agree with April is cash flow. You know, are you going to have the cash to pay it? Um, if you're, if I just finish this off before I go into that, um, if you're on, on single touch payroll, but you don't have your, your software provider hasn't upgraded yet and hasn't upgraded for the time by 30th of April sort of thing, there is another mechanism where you go through the business portal um, and you can do it electronically. There'll be an, um, a pre-fill that you can fill, um, which gets it from single touch payroll, it connects to it and it uploads that information. Now I haven't manually done it myself, so I can't give you step by step, blow by blow how to do it. Um, but look, I think your payroll person will be able to figure it out. Um, it's effectively, they go through the business portal, whether they're under or over 200 employees. Now this question that I had, um, which is, is probably relevant for what our discussions are now. Um, and the question was basically, um, you qualify, for JobKeeper as an employer. You have a lot of employees that are stood down because the market's very bad at the moment. Um, you probably don't, can't afford right now to pay them all $3,000 in the month of April. Now, uh, we've asked the ATO that question, or Treasury actually has something on, on the uh, website, um, which says that, yeah, recognise that you might not have the cash, 
they say go to the bank, get the get the money from the bank because they'll lend it to you because you're going to be guaranteed against um, against the job keeper. And it's as quick and simple as that. James, can you um, enlighten us on how quickly and and simply that would be? I mean, we're sitting here on the 23rd of April. How realistic is that? I I, I don't think it's very realistic at all. Uh, or maybe I'm wrong. Unless you already have arrangements in place, relatively unrealistic. So. Yeah, so it's not like somebody can go up to you, James, and say, oh yeah, look, I just need a bit of cash flow right now. Um, I don't have any overdrafts and I've got no money and the bank's going to really lend me something now? Yeah, well, there are the, which I'll cover shortly, there is the ability to secure up to 250000 which is also partly guaranteed by the government. But we've already assisted some clients through that process and it's not quick. Um, you, no. you would probably need to allow three weeks as a minimum because they actually document the loans and, you know, three weeks to four weeks to settle the loan. So, yeah. Yeah. so I won't steal your thunder. Thank you for that. Um, but yeah, no, I think the, the reality of it is I think you can still get the 250, which James will go through. But can you get it right now when you need it to be paid by the end of April? Realistically, no, but you know, that's, that's always um, the tax office or the treasury giving you some really good solutions. So what someone's asked is, could they select and pay certain employees and not pay others, but then pay them in May and continue from there? I don't have a solid answer to that. I mean, we're um, asking, we're gonna ask the ATO because I think it's an important question. But one way of thinking about it is that if you didn't pay the salary, it probably won't register, you, you know, in, on the STP. So you won't get reimbursed for those. So if you don't pay, you won't get reimbursed. Now, that means as long as you pay them by the next fortnight, which I think is the 11th of May, but don't take my word for it, um, the 1500 at least, then you're back in the game and you make sure you elect them. But this is only, you know, an assumption I'm making. Um, we'll get confirmation on that. So I don't know who wrote this question, but we can come back to the group because I think it is an important question, especially for this group here. And the other thing you're going to have to do on a monthly basis. So this is important to have your projected um, GST turnover. Um, cash flow, but you know, Cash flow may be different to your projected GST turnover. So what do you think you're going to get if you are projecting month to month? So on the 7th of each month, so seven days within, say, 7th of May, um, the ATO is going to have um, allow you to link onto the business portal and make monthly declarations. So what does that look like? It means that you're going to have to report for the month of April and then you're going to, which what was your actual, because you'd already done your projections, and then also project for the month of May. So it is a projection because we haven't passed May. Now they only want this, not because we're restating, we want to retest our eligibility. This is simply for them to have for their records. Okay, so it is more of a big data collecting exercise. Um, I have some questions here. Did we want to go through them at the end? Um, these questions that I've got yes, on the sheet of paper. Yeah, so I'll, I'll yeah, go. Can through. we? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. I don't know if my next slide has the. Um... Oh yeah, can you go back? So I think just uh, what I wanted to mention is there's two grants, the New South Wales um, grant, um, and Kim will send you the the link to that. That is a grant that if your turnover has come down by 75%, you have one to 19 employees, your turnover is, would have been greater than 75,000. Uh, there's probably other conditions there, but they're the main ones. Um, you, you're entitled to a grant for 10,000 from New South Wales. And look, I've sent it to one of my clients. They filled out the form online um, and they said it was very easy and, they're, and, they've, and they've, already, they've already brought the money. So I think, um, and it's open till 1 June. So worth having a look at if you already haven't had a look at it. The other one is City of Sydney um, has also another grant of 10,000. Now they really more talk about whether you've been devastated by the COVID-19 and an opportunity to get that grant of 10,000. They don't have a, a clear turnover test that I could see. So they're the two that are useful. And also from a payroll perspective, 
um, effectively there's there's three um, scenarios, but the main one to to keep in mind is that you don't have to pay your March, April, May payroll if you've got um, taxable wages um, of $10, $10 million or less. So some of you are probably not in that arena. So some of you are not even paying payroll. So it's probably not a big difference, but um, I just wanted to point that out. Um, Kim, sorry, yeah. So these are the kind of services we're providing our clients. So we're helping them enroll. Um, we're helping them prepare. Now, I don't like to enrol anyone unless we've looked at the um, aggregated turnover and, and basically the turnover tests, because you can see if you get that wrong, um, we could be liable as well as yourself. So um, we probably wouldn't lodge the applicant enrolment form unless we're checking those figures that you've put together. Happy to review them, um, but understand the logic of why you're doing it. And we could do that bit, but we can also just assist with um, ascertaining eligible employees. So there's a fair few things we can assist with. Um, and, you know, there's probably some that are, might need the alternative test. So if that's the case, we can certainly assist there. So I guess the poll question is, do you want us to contact you regarding these services? Entirely up to yourself. Um, but, you know, if we do provide the service, we usually work on a time basis and we would, negotiate, we would discuss with you what that looks like. And I know you're all tight, and uh, that's why I hesitate to mention it, um, but it wouldn't be pro bono, put it that way. I know that sounds very terrible, doesn't it? Yeah, so there's a lot of information on the JobKeeper. I think it can be a little overwhelming, as some have mentioned. Um, but I find the ATO website not bad. I think it's, 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 it's not bad, um, maybe because I know it. So it, it's, when I read it, it makes sense to me. Um, but if you just keep in mind, you're gonna get a copy of these slides. Just those little points that I've mentioned are the things that you really need to focus on. Um, and if you look at those, look up those, if you want a bit more information or come and talk to us. You know, we're always happy for a chat. Uh, there's no issue with having a chat. I just, um, I hesitate, I won't. And, Happy to chat with you without charging you um, at the beginning, but I think at some point, you know, when we're actually reviewing or doing work for you, that might be different. So I've ended that poll, Mariana. Thank you. So we'll now hand it over to James. Thank you. Thanks, Kim, and welcome everyone. Um, Kim, I'm mindful of time, so I might yes. just quickly uh, run through a few things and that I think in questions are going to be important so I'll just bridge com compress this down a little um, I guess what's important is how a little bit about me um, where I can help and also I just want to cover some things that I am seeing at the moment um, myself I've had 25 years banking experience working with the banks my last role I uh, was running corporate and business banking for St. George um, for about 12 or 13 years. So come with lots of experience. Um, I started HLB Debt Advisory here with the firm three and a half years ago. And since that time, we've either advised or completed transactions of well in excess of half a billion dollars. So quite well experienced right from personal lending all the way through to corporate finance. And um, in terms of what I'm seeing at the moment, particularly in the business sector, I'll give you an example of someone that I'm helping at the moment who is an essential service business. So someone that actually hasn't been that badly impacted by COVID. Um, I'm putting in place quite a number of working capital facilities for a number of their businesses because what they are already seeing is a reduction in some demand, um, even though they're in, the, in an essential services business. They are, are also seeing their debtors pay them more slowly, which is impacting their cash flow. And they are also concerned about some of their debtors uh, longevity, uh, not just maybe in the next three to six months, but beyond that. And they wanna make sure that they've got working capital lines in place to cover any of these eventualities. Um, their debtor days has already gone up by about eight or nine days since COVID impacted. And they're probably expecting it to go up another 15 days. And that's what they're forecasting. So that just gives you a perspective of someone that runs a business extremely well, not as badly impacted by COVID, but they're concerned. Um, 
I'm also helping clients in, in dealing with the banks. And I'll just quickly run through what the banks are doing um, and how they can assist. Um, as touched on earlier, there is a up to a $250,000 unsecured loan. By unsecured, I mean that they won't take asset security to consider these loans, but they will. Most lenders who are registered and approved to provide these loans will be taking either director's guarantees or, or guarantees of, of the owners of the business. Um, so just keeping that in mind. They are loans that will be provided for up to three years and the first six months will be interest and repayment free. But then for the remaining term of the loan through to the three years, it needs to be fully amortized. So you do need to take that into account in terms of cash flow impact. There's other things that they're doing to support in the business market, really any transactions that they currently have of up to a million, and I am, and we have helped customers with many more millions of dollars in having either interest uh, payments deferred for upwards of six months, or principal repayments if they were contracted principal repayments deferred as well for upwards of six months. So that in particular, the banks are being quite flexible. In fact, one major bank, the Commonwealth Bank, have wrote to all of their customers for anyone that had a loan of under a million dollars, a business loan under a million dollars, and automatically you had to opt out to actually not um, get a three month deferral on your, on your loan repayments. So the banks are being quite supportive in that type of environment. If you're looking for the $250,000 loans, I do suggest you would need to allow three to four weeks before you get approvals and settlements of those types of monies. So just to keep that in mind. Just the next slide, um, Kim. So there is also support for the residential market, um, not similar to the commercial market in that, um, but because you're lending personally and there's more requirements around lending personally, they are considering up to three month deferrals of both interest and principal repayments. Um, and then a check in at three months and then possibly another three months is sort of what the banks are all communicating. But outside of that, um, if uh, they're also looking to support people in deposit rates, particularly if you're able to lock money away. And if you were, have home loans or investment loans and you're prepared to fix rates, those rates for most of the banks now are in the very low twos. Um, so that's something to also consider. Um, Kim, that's probably it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, to all the participants, um, we are happy to stay for another 10 minutes to answer the question. So I've got seven questions sitting in the Q&A box at the moment, um, and I've got uh, five or six from Facebook. Um, so if you need to go, we, you know, please, um, if you need to go, then you can leave the meeting. But I will be providing slides and the recording to yourselves so that you can go back through those again. So I'm just going to start the questions now, the Q&A. Um, and look, most of these are tax related. So I'll just start with the first one, which is what happens if I pay my employees the JobKeeper and then find out that my business is entitled to it? So I think you meant um, not entitled to it. I think so. Oh, they've corrected yes. it down the bottom there. Yeah. Um, well, that's why I think it's important. I mean, remember we're talking about um, March. You can, you're pretty much going to be safe on March and you're probably going to be safe on April because we're nearly at the end of it. So you're going to be fairly sure for those two months. But say you project April to June and, you know, you've projected something worse and something changed. Well, I don't know what's going to happen really because, I mean, the, they base it on um, projections. And if you've projected you're going to have the downturn of 30% or more, and you can actually prove that downturn. Um, and that's why I say you have to have bulletproof when you're doing your projections. Um, so, and then what happens, your actual skims it. So it's 29.5 or 28.5. I think if it's marginal, it's not going to be a big issue. Um, but if it's 10%, that's significant that'll be a significant difference and the ATO may require you to pay it back. So I think when it gets to that point, what we would have to do is probably go to the ATO and say, well, we'll know further before we get there um, and sort of say, look, we've, these are our projections. Um, something happened we hadn't predicted. 
Um, so effectively, you know, we've been getting the payment. What do we do now? And and ask and ask them, uh, you know, because we don't want to pay it, pay it back because it'll be paid back with penalties and interest. If we had a reasonable estimate, they might ask us to pay it back without penalties and interest. But we don't know enough yet which way they'll go. I think the main thing is that this money is going to employees. It's going, you know, it's keeping the economy going. Okay, and is in regarding rent, this may be for you, Matt. Uh, yep. If we are a national company, is the reduction in turnover based on each individual state or as a whole, as we rent in each state of Australia? Well, not, not understanding the exact... I think it's the code of conduct, this. whether the code of conduct is for all states. Well, it, yeah, it is, it, is, it is a code of conduct which was um, developed by the federal government, um, which each state has to actually um, legislate. Um, but let's just assume that, that um, they all have. Um, look, not understanding the exact corporate structure of, of this entity. However, the way the code is written, what I've read, um, they, look, they look at stuff on a group level when assessing turnover, so it wouldn't be on a state-by-state -state basis, but that would depend if you have each state and state operations in a different corporate structure, that may be different. So I might ask, I might take it offline and, and call people in this. Yes, this okay. Um, oh, yep. Thank you, Matt, for that one. Yeah, and applying Matt, for and job. I, I just, uh, I think it would be probably every landlord, right? Because it'd be a landlord thing. They're all different landlords on each state. Hmm. Yeah, yep. interesting question. So in applying for JobKeeper, is there any specific order that the application process needs to be completed? Yeah, well, if you look at the ATO website, they say get your nominations first, have those, then en enrol, um, and then make sure your um, single touch payroll is up to date by 30th of April or 4th of May um, if you're not doing it, um, if you don't have, um, your software isn't, uh, JobKeeper uh, compatible, compatible. So, but uh, uh, look, I don't think it matters so long it's all done by the end of April. They're a bit flexible with that, practically. Okay. We had a good May 2019 and look like we will be 30% lower in May 20. Should we apply for May? And if so, by when? So anonymous, I don't know whether you actually met the criteria in March or April. So, or, so there's three different tests you could do before May, and that is March, April, or April to June. So, I mean, I would do the quarter of April to June and see if you were already um, under then. Um, if none of those tests work, then yes, I would go to May and test for May. And I would test it at the beginning of May. If you meet the criteria, then so long as if you, in that first fortnightly period of May, you pay 1500 per employee, then, it starts from that point and then it goes on to the end of September. Remember, it's tested once. Once you meet the criteria, it doesn't matter what happens after um, that month. So you might have a bumper month, the next one, or and then go down again and so on. I think they've made it that way because it would just be too hard to administer to come in and out of the scheme. Yeah. Um, James, for you, what happens if we get loan approval up to 250K then we decide we don't need the loan down the track. Okay, so look, it'll depend on each lender, um, but in the main, it is a variable rate facility and most of the major banks in particular have set up special units to do these loans. And once you get approval and you've signed the documentation, they will settle the loan. Um, so they won't come and ask you <laughs> again, uh, whether you wanted the money or not. But reminding it is a variable rate loan, you don't have repayments to make for the first six months, although interest will accrue. So if you don't need it, you would just repay it. Um, keeping in mind that usually most of these loans are around the four, four and a half percent level. So who knows, might, it might be better than some of the other loans you might have at the moment, but uh, just repay it would be my advice. Yep. How long must we retain records for the ATO? Uh, five years. Like your normal records, tax records. Thank you. I might, I might just add, Kim, though, you know, as um, under the Corporations Act, you need to retain your books and records for seven years. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what's that, tax can... returns or accounts or both? That's, that's just ASIC's guide when it comes to books and records. So, your financial records. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Are we required to pay super based on the $1,500 per fortnight payment to staff? It depends. Um, if um, you stood down your employees and you're paying them, so the um, it's only on if you've, um, what's it called, the top up. So if a 1500 is a top up or um, a variable of 1500 is a top up, then you don't have to pay super on that. That's up to the employer whether they want to pay super. Um, if you don't want to pay super, you don't have to. Only requirement to pay super is on the salary. Hence why I think the single touch payroll has that split in it where you'll say, you know, I pay my employee $1,000, a normal regular salary, and the top up is 500 less tax um, in a separate section because that portion won't have super having to be paid on it, whereas the other portion would, the normal 9%. Thank you. And I've got two questions, and these are from, these are from the Facebook page. I'm finding the information still very unclear from all avenues and not sure as to what to do. Here is our scenario. We have no work as we're in the events industry. Our staff are more than 12 month old casuals and have been on stand down since mid-March. So not getting paid anything at the moment. Do we have to be paying the $1,500 now to be able to be a candidate for getting this? I know we should qualify for it, but the question is, I guess, what if they say we don't and we paid this money out? Having said that, we have no cash flow. So how are you supposed to pay it in the first place? I just don't want my staff to miss out. It sounds, um, I think that was the question I was answering before. Um, it sounds to me like you're eligible. If you don't have the cash, you probably, you know, if you're in the events business, there's no events happening at the moment unless you can get someone to pay on, on, on a webinar. Um, so it sounds to me like you're eligible. Um, so I don't think that'd be a concern. I think the question was more like, I don't have the cash flow, how do I pay them? Um, and as James was saying, you could get some borrow money um, because they know the job keeper's coming. But if you haven't already got an established bank and loan, that might be a bit difficult. Um, so we've sort of written to, we're writing to the ATO to inquire um, whether what I think can happen and what might be able, you might be able to do is say, you might pay certain employees that you have enough money for, which I think is what you're lo looking at doing. And then those other employees that you can't pay, you don't pay them. They won't, you won't get JobKeeper for them, nor will they get any money. But once um, you get some money together, you can pay, you can start paying them in, in May. Now, I don't know that will work, um, but it's something that we'll look into. Thank you. Um, and Nick, I would just like to hand it over to yourself to do the wrap up, thank you. Thanks, Kim, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I do appreciate there's a lot of content uh, to cover off and, and this is, um, as, as Marianne indicated, um, a lot of developments are happening um, very regularly and frequently. Um, so thank you um, for, for joining, as I said, um, on our website um, and in the link that will be sent around afterwards, we do have some up-to-date information and we'll continue to update that um, with various information. Um, and we'll also include some information around there for uh, the various um, support mechanism from, from the government uh, around the country. Um, so one final question um, uh, here as, as you leave, um, if you'd like someone from HLB Manjad to contact you, um, please uh, indicate uh, on, on uh, the, the feedback there and we'll be in contact with you. So once again, thank you very much for joining us today um, and um, we wish you all well. Thank you. Just thank one you. last thing, I will be providing to HRIA for everyone the session today, uh, this recorded session together with the PowerPoint slides and also the documentation that Mariana was referring to in terms of those two grants. And I do know that I have provided uh, to HRIA the links uh, in terms of the ATO. Oh, the so again, um, single touch payroll, yeah. Yes, and single okay. touch payroll. So thank you very much.